All right, so you had a discussion of the four of you um, about the crime scene, is that right? Yes. Okay. And then what else did you talk about? That I believe that I brought up the fact that I had been told earlier in the evening that uh, I was to notify O.J. Simpson of the death of Nicole Brown and that we had his children and I was to do that in person. And I'd received that order from Commander Bushy. Now, in the, in the West L.A. Division where you work, sir, <clears throat> are there a lot of uh, wealthy and famous people there? Yes. Have you been requested to give VIP treatment before? Just an object that's simple. We approach on those. Sure. All right, thank you, Council. Ms. Clark, would you proceed, please? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. <clears throat> Notifications. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Detective Phillips. <clears throat> Have you been requested to give VIP treatment before, sir? Yes. And, and tell us what's, what is meant by that. Well, it's um, a little bit extra that the police department does. Uh, we have a lot of individuals in West Los Angeles Division that uh, celebrity, uh, VIPs, wealthy people. Uh, sometimes their name comes across and the department does certain things to you know, to help them out or do certain things a little bit more than on a normal occasion. <clears throat> on how many occasions have you been requested by Commander Bushy to make personal notification to the next of kin in a homicide case? This would be the first time. Now, you're a homicide detective, is that yes. right? Yes. Is there a policy with respect to how notifications to the next of kin are supposed to be made? Yes. And what is that policy? Policy is that whenever practical, the uh, homicide investigator assigned to the case should notify the next of kin if the next of kin lives in the area that the homicide occurred. If they do not live in that area and they live outside the area, then a police officer from that adjoining area would make that notification. And if it's out of state, then we'd make uh, inquiries to that jurisdiction to make notifications then. All right. Is it done in per? Is it is it the policy to do make those notifications in person or by telephone? Whenever possible, is to be done in person. And why is that? Well, I think it's uh, a courteous thing to do that the police department tries to do. Instead of making a phone call and telling somebody that somebody's dead, we we try to do it this way. It doesn't always work that way, but we try. So why is it so unusual that Commander Bushy told you to make the person the notification to uh, the defendant in person? It's not unusual that we were making the notification. It's uh, unusual that the commander gave me a direct order that I should do everything I could to find Mr. Simpson and notify him in person before the news media became aware of what happened out at that residence. He thought it would be very insensitive if we knew about it and did not notify him in person prior to the news media notifying him.
Now, at the time that you, in, you informed Detective Lang and Detective Van Adder that you were going to go out uh, to notify the defendant, uh, was there some decision or discussion concerning whether they would go with you or not? Well, it was, it was kind of a, a conversation, yes. It was a conversation that took part, and this was all part of the same conversation. We were all talking at one time. And what was, what, what was discussed about that? Well, I was making the statement that I need to go up and notify O.J. Simpson, if I can, about this death. And they were making the statement, well, we should probably go up and, and talk to O.J. Simpson at the same time and get a statement from him, or maybe he can give us some information. And it was determined that since they were the investigating officers on the scene, and they were the ones that were going to do the investigation, that they should be the ones that talk to O.J. Simpson. And after he was talked to, then I would take it from there. All right, so did you want the uh, det detectives Lang and Van Adder to go along because they were thinking you were all just considering the defendant to be a suspect at that time? No, we never considered Mr. Simpson to be a suspect at that time. What was the information that everybody was thinking he could give? Sustain. Well, they were talking. What did you think he could give? What information did you think Mr. Simpson could give at that time? Well, for one thing, we had a body there that we had no idea who that was. That was a male body there. Um, we didn't know if Mr. Simpson had any knowledge of Mrs. Simpson's whereabouts the night before, uh, if he could give us some information on who this person was. As far as we knew, the individual that was lying there could have as easily been a suspect. We had no idea who this individual was. So then were arrangements made to go uh, to the defendant's home? Yes, there was. How did you find out where that was? I believe Detective Furman asked Officer Risky to run the Jeep at the rear of the residence to see what address it came back to. And what address did it come back to? 360 Rockingham. So how did you decide to uh, proceed to 360 Rockingham? 360. 360. Yes. Uh, Detective Furman and I went in our car, and Detective Van Adder and Lang went in their car. And we went first to uh, basically cut down the time and show them where, what the uh, quickest route to that location was. So you went in two separate cars? Yes, there was a reason for that. And what was the reason for that? Well, they, Van Adder and Lang were going to return as soon as they talked to Mr. Simpson. Uh, Furman and I were going to stay at the Simpson residence, and my theory, along with uh, after talking to Lieutenant Spangler before we left this location, was that we were going to offer Mr. Simpson a ride, if possible, if he wanted it, back to West L.A. Station to pick up his children. There was a possibility he may have been too upset to drive or that we should have allowed him to drive. I did not want Mr. Simpson going back to the Bundy location to see the scene, so I was going to do whatever I could to keep him from going to Bundy. So I was going to offer Mr. Simpson my services, my police vehicle, until he got some support, or at least we got his children back to him. Okay. Why did you want to keep him from the Bundy scene? Oh, well. well, I didn't want Mr. Simpson going back to see the, the very bloody crime scene. I had no idea at that time the relationship between Mr. Simpson and, and Nicole Brown. So you wanted to prevent him from the trauma of seeing that? Sustained, leading. Sorry. <clears throat> Did you have some concern for Mr. Simpson's welfare in going back to the 875 South Bundy scene? Please, yes. Oh, well. Yes. And what was that concern? I did not want him to have to face and see that scene, which was a very bloody scene, a very traumatic scene. So you took two cars? That's correct. And you were the lead, you said? Yes. And why were you leading? Detective Furman knew the way. Had, uh, had one of the other officers at the uh, scene told uh, Detective Furman how to get there that night? Sustain. Before you left, did Detective Furman say he was going to go and ask for directions? Seriously. Sustain. Under? 
this day? I can't give a theory. I have a theory. Okay. I thought of the theory and I've sustained it. Right. Sustained. You. You're welcome. I haven't tried. Sustained. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so you, you and um, Detective Furman led, and then Detective Van Adder and Detective Lang followed in their car. Yes. About how long did it take you to get to uh, the location of 360 Rockingham from 875 South Bundy? No more than five minutes. What time? W back up, I forgot to ask you something. What time did uh, Detective Van Adder get to the location of 875 South Bundy that night? I believe he arrived at 4.25 or 4.30 in the morning. And uh, Detective Lang? I'm sorry, Detective Van Adder arrived at 4.05. I'm sorry, Detective Lang arrived at 4.25 to 4.30. And what time did you leave 875 South Bundy? Uh, just shortly before 5 in the morning. And you, what time did you arrive at 360 North Rockingham? Approximately 5.05, 5.10. Now, when the four of you left 875 South Bundy, did you tell anyone about it, or did you just pack up and go? No, I had walked over to Lieutenant Spangler and John Rogers and informed them of where we were going and what we were doing and told them that we should be back in a very short time and and I informed Lieutenant Spangler of my intentions of, of offering my services to O.J. Simpson. And you uh, spoke to Lieutenant Rogers as well then? Well, he was standing in the area. I wasn't speaking directly at him. I was speaking directly at Lieutenant Spangler. Okay. When you left, who was in charge of the crime scene at 875 South Bundy? Lieutenant Rogers. Did you, um, did you have any conversation with Lieutenant Rogers about what he would do with the crime scene in your absence? No. And did you, did you see uh, Detective Furman go over to ask for directions from another officer there? Same question. Sustain. Did you see Detective Furman go over to Officer Risky at some point? Yes. And was that just before you left for 360 North Rockingham? A few minutes before, yes. After Detective Furman spoke to Officer Risky, did he come back to you? Yes. Did he give you some information? Yes. And did that concern the route you would take to 360 okay. North Rockingham? Sustain. 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 Can we approach? Sure. All right, Ms. Clark, would you allow the court reporter to change paper? Yes. Madam Reporter. <coughs> All right, Ms. Clark. <coughs> Certainly.
Your Honor, I have here a board meeting photographs as that the uh, board remarked people's I'm sorry, Your Honor, next in order. People sixty two. Sixty two. All right, sixty two. And Miss Clark, would you uh, have your assistance uh, put on letters on any remaining so we can avoid the confusion? Yes. Sir. Great. Thank you. If I may, for the time being, simply indicate, Your Honor, what they are. Certainly. Um, as to the top three, starting from the left over A, B, and C, and then beginning from the lower right hand, lower left hand corner, uh, D, E, and F. Sixty-two. People sixty-two. Eight through All right, sir. Did you? Uh, what route did you take to get to three sixty North Rockingham? Uh, went north on Bundy, uh, and then on Kenter, I believe it was, to Sunset. Made a left on Sunset. Traveled westbound on Sunset to Rockingham, and turned northbound on Rockingham. And when you went northbound on Rockingham, uh, what did you see? As we approached the uh, 360 North Rockingham address, I observed a white vehicle parked on the east curb facing northbound. And what kind of vehicle was that that you saw? It was a white Ford Bronco. Directing your attention, sir, to the photographs that are now marked as 62A through F. Can you tell me if you recognize what's shown there? Yes, that appears to be the white uh, vehicle that I saw parked in the location where it was parked at. And can you see what, no, never mind. Did you notice that right away when you uh, started to drive north on Rockingham, that vehicle? I just noticed the vehicle there because I pulled in kind of in front of the vehicle and made a right-hand turn onto Ashford and parked my vehicle, so I had to pay attention to it. But it just had to pay attention to it as I drove up. And why did you have to pay attention to it? So I wouldn't hit it. L let me ask you about that. Rockingham, is that, is that a real wide street? Overall, overall, anybody who drives in Southern California knows the difference. The jury has been there. Is that a very wide street? It's not a real wide street, no. Where did you park? I parked on uh, Ashford just after I made the right off of Rockingham onto Ashford uh, on the south curb of Ashford. It's going to be Rockingham photos. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, may, may this photograph be marked people 63. Right, people next in order 63. You recognize what's shown in that photograph, sir? Yes, that's the uh, O.J. Simpson residence. You said that you parked on the, um, around the corner from the Bronco? Yes. Can you uh, tell us approximately where you parked uh, in this photograph? Can you show us, that is? Um, right, right about in that location there. Right there? Right there. Okay. And do you recall where Detective Lang and Detective Van Adder parked. Yes. I, I, I don't recall where they parked. Mm -hmm. And when you got there, so did, did you and Detective Furman get out? Yes. And what happened next? Uh, the four of us walked up to the Ashford gate and I believe that I was the, the first one to push the uh, intercom buzzer to try and raise someone in the residence. Now, when you went to the Ashford gate, sir, let me ask you this. The gate, was it covered with any kind of uh, material? No, it was just a wrought iron gate. Okay. In the photograph next to you that's been marked as 62D, 
That would be the lower left-hand photograph? Yes. Can you tell us what gate is depicted in that photograph? That would be the Rockingham gate. And does that depict the gate in the condition you saw it on uh, June the 13th? Yes. The, the uh, vehicle that's depicted in these photographs, A through E, is that the vehicle that you've described having seen on uh, parked just north of the Rockingham gate at 360 North Rockingham? Yes. And the position in which it's parked in these photographs, is that the position in which you saw it parked in the early morning hours of June the 13th? Yes. <coughs> We're printing that, right? Uh, Your Honor, may, may the, the print of the image be marked as uh, 63A? 63A. Uh, Your Honor, may this next image be marked P, uh, People's Exhibit 64? 64, next in order. Okay, sir, do you recognize what's shown in that photograph? Yes, that's the uh, Simpson residence, and I believe that that would be the Ashford Gate. And is that the gate that you just described that the four of you walked up to? Yes. Is it, is it in the condition in which you saw it on June the 13th, 1994? Yes. From the, where was it, if you can tell us, and if you can see in this photograph, where was it that you went to try and make contact with... Uh, with the house? Well, there's a speaker box uh, intercom system just to the left of the driveway as you walk up, uh, right about where those bushes are, that uh, you push a button and hopefully can, somebody talks to you. Can you tell us where, where it is in this photograph? Um, it's right about where the, the uh, white flowers there, the white plants are, right about in, a little bit left, right about in that area there. Okay. Is that, is that it? What's been circled? Right, the wood is circled before Mr. Uh, circle, circle. Is there a possibility we can get a telestrator up here on, on the uh, witness stand? We can, but it's, it's really very, it's not easy to use, Your Honor. I mean, we'd have to show, teach the witnesses first. Because you don't see an image here, it's blank. You have to look at the screen. I don't really it. see it. I know where it's located, but I don't really see it in this photograph. Okay, that, but that was the... Can you uh, direct the pointer down to the general location where you remember it being? He indicated it was above the white bush. Mm -hmm. Can we put an X there then? Is it's that some, it? It's somewhere in that vicinity right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's, let's try this again. How about we just put an arrow on the bush? Yeah. That's the white bush. It's above the white bush. Okay. Just leave, and just leave an it. arrow. A little more left. A little more left? Yeah. All right. All right, just leave area. the arrow there. Can we leave the arrow there? Perfect. All right. Can we put initials on it? Some of this whiz-bang stuff has too much whiz. It does. It does. <clears throat> All right, so when you went to press the buzzer, sir, could you hear it buzzing? Yes. And did you get any answer? No. How many times did you buzz that buzzer? Several times in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Not myself as being the only one that did it. Several of the other officers also pushed it. So how many officers were there? Four. Now, when you went to press the buzzer, where did Detective uh, uh, Van Adder and Lang go? We all stood right there for the first couple of minutes, hoping that someone would uh, acknowledge us. And at some point, did you fan out? Yes. Where did, who went where? I believe I walked back to my car and got my cellular telephone. And what about Detective Lang? Where did he go? 
don't recall where he went. What about Detective Furman? Do you know where he went? I, I don't recall where they went. Uh, everybody was talking and pushing buzzers and going different locations, and I went back to get my cellular phone. I was going to call the watch commander. How, how far apart did you spread out? Well, to be honest with you, I really wasn't paying attention to what each one of us was doing at that time. Uh, Next question. What were you doing? I went back to my car to get my cellular telephone. And for what purpose did you do that? Call the watch commander. Why? Because I'd noticed a West Tech sign in the front yard. And I thought perhaps West Tech might be able to assist us in raising somebody at that location or giving us a phone number of someone at that location. And so you called the watch commander? I called Sergeant Rossi at the West Los Angeles watch commander's office. Can you have a moment, Your Honor? You may. Do you happen to have memorized the phone number that, uh, for the watch commander that you used that night? Yes. Do you use it often? Yes. i show you a phone number that has been written down previously and marked as people 61 and ask you if you recognize the phone number. Yes, that's the inside private line. For the watch commander? Yes. And is that the uh, phone number that you dialed that night on your cell phone? Yes, it is. You spoke to Sergeant Rossi? Yes. Did you ask him to do something? Yes. What? I asked him to get a hold of West Tech Security and ask him if they could assist us in raising someone at that residence, getting a phone number for us at that residence, uh, possibly getting a key for us at that residence, and also telling us if they had any information whether the people that were at that residence were out of town for an extended period of time or not. And did you receive word back from Sergeant Rossi? Yes, I did. After you had made, I made that request of him? Yes. And did he give you some information? Yes. Based on what he told you, what did you do? Well, based on what he told me, uh, I didn't get the information that I requested, other than the fact that I was, I'd learned that there was no record of anybody being out of town. So I asked them to send a unit, a West Tech unit, to our location. And then, oh, well. what happened next? A short time later, after a couple more phone calls were made, a West Tech unit was driving southbound on Rockingham, and I flagged him down in the middle of Rockingham and Ashford. <clears throat> and did you go and talk to that person? Yes, I did. What did you, did you make some request of him? Originally, I asked him if he was the unit that had responded to our call, and he did not know what call I was referring to. And then I asked him, I said, do you have a phone number, or can you get me a phone number to this residence? And he made an inquiry and then told me that he could not... Oh, well. He told me he could not do that for security reasons. What was your response to that? I informed him that I was a Los Angeles police detective, that I was investigating a crime, and then I wanted the a phone number of that residence, and if he couldn't give it to me, then to get a supervisor out here that could. What happened next? A uh, short time later, the West Tech officer gave me the phone number to the residence. And who did you get it from? Do you remember? I got it from that same West Tech officer that I had flagged down that was still at the location. Now, at the time that you got the phone number, uh, did that West Tech patrol officer stay there? Yes, he did. And when you got the phone number, did another West Tech unit arrive? Shortly thereafter, a West Tech supervisor, a sergeant from West Tech, showed up. What did you do after you got the defendant's phone number? I phoned the residence. <laughs> now, at some point, did Detective Furman come and report some observation he had made to you? 
Yes, he did. Was that before or after you got the defendant's phone number? That was before I got the phone number. And what was the observation that you was sustained? Okay. Did he make some remark to you about something he had seen? Overall. Yes. And based on what he told you, sir, did you go and uh, observe something? Yes. What was that? I observed a spot on the Bronco on the pass on the driver's door, just above the door handle, that uh, was a brownish red small dot. And, and directing your attention, sir, to the photographs that have been marked as people 62 B and C. Do you see what's being shown in those photographs? Yes. What? It's a man pointing to a uh, spot on the driver's door, and then it's a close-up of what he's pointing to with a figure of number one in his hand, N numeral number one. Is that the location in which you saw the uh, spot that you've just indicated you saw that night? Yes. And did you make that observation before or after you got the defendant's phone number? Before. Did you call? Uh, did you call the phone number that you were given for the defendant? Yes. And how soon after receiving the phone number did you call? Within a couple of minutes. It just with however long it took me to put in the cellular phone and send it. And where was everybody when you made that phone call? Walking around between the Bronco, the Ashford Gate. I was kind of left out by myself talking to the West Tech officer and using my telephone. And where was the West Tech officer? He was parked in the middle of the street on Rockingham facing southbound almost into the intersection of Ashford, just north of the intersection of Ashford. Equal 64A. Going back to this, you indicated that uh, the other detectives were between the Ashford Gate and the uh, Bronco? Yes. Hey, do you see that location depicted in this photograph, sir? That area? Yes. <clears throat> On the uh, left-hand side of the photograph, do you see the location of the Ashford Gate? Yes. Can you direct the pointer to that area, please? To the pointer of the Ashford Gate? To the Ashford Gate. Okay. Let's put the... Get the, okay. Tell it where to go. That's the Ashford Gate. Okay, you can make a small X there. Is that correct, sir? That's, that's the Ashford Gate, yes. Okay. And in this photograph, where the Bronco would be? It's completely to the right side of the picture. You can just barely see the front end of it. That white spot? Right. Make an X. Or, yeah, why don't we just leave the arrow there? Thank you, Jonathan. Initial that. And where were you? Well, it'd it have to find out what time. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We're talking about the time when you're talking to uh, getting the phone number of the defendant and using your cell phone to call. Well, the, I was more or less in the middle of the intersection uh, making phone calls to Sergeant Rossi, making, talking to the West Tech uh, officer. When the West Tech officer showed up, he was southbound on Rockingham, uh, just, had just entered the intersection of Ashford and Rockingham, had not gone all the way through it. Can you direct that uh, cross to, to that location? Uh, 
That would be an approximate location. I mean, depth, depth perception is the only thing that's lacking. But that'd be, that'd be close. Okay. Thank you. Then using your cell phone, you made the call to the defendant's residence. Is that right, sir? Yes. Great chart now that's been marked as People 65. Can you tell us if you recognize what is uh, shown in this chart? That's a uh, photocopy of my phone bill, a cellular phone that I was using that night for the date of 612 uh, to 613, 94. And that's the cell phone you were using on the date of June the 13th, 1994? Yes. And do you see a phone call at the time of 5.36 a.m. for June the 13th made from your cell phone to the number 310-476-4619? Yes. And now it's being shown up on the, on the screen. I'm going to indicate that with the uh, laser. If you could see it, can you see it, sir? Yes. Do you see what I'm indicating on the screen there for the jury? Yes. So at 536, you called this number 310-476-4619? Yes. And where did you get that phone number from? Uh, that's the phone number I received from the West Tech officer. When you dialed that number, what happened? I received a recording, uh, answering machine recording. And what, what was it, what it said, what did the answering machine say? Sorry. <clears throat> well, I don't recall exactly what it said, but it made reference to the fact of, hello, this is OJ, I'm not home, um, leave a message, something to, the, something to that effect. So you got an answering machine? Yes. Did you inform anyone of that, of the fact that you got an answering machine, no one answered the phone? Yes, I informed the other detectives at the scene that uh, no one answered, that there was an answering service. Now, did the West Tech? Okay, thank you. Did the West Tech supervisor remain there for a period of time while you were there? Yes, he did. Um, both West Tech units stayed there for a little bit of time. And did uh, did someone, one of the detectives, have a conversation with West Tech about whether or not a maid was supposed to be on the premises? Yes. And did you learn anything about that, sir? Yes. What did you find out? Sustained. You and the other detectives learned something about a maid being on the premises, is that right? Yes. Did you then have a conversation? Oh, well, proceed. Did you then have a conversation amongst you, uh, or did uh, Detective Van Adder, Detective Lang, Detective Furman have a conversation about what they were going to do next? Yes, I was just separate from yes, the group. The answer is yes or no. Yes, yes. The conversation. Next question. And after that conversation, sir, what happened next? Uh, Detective Furman uh, went over the wall of the Rockingham residence. Was that at someone's request? Yes. Whose? 
Van Adder or Lang, I believe it was Van Adder. And what happened next? The detective Furman then opened the gate from the inside and allowed the other ones of us in. <clears throat> Again, that's the uh, gate you've identified as the Ashford Gate. Is that the one you all went through? Yes. And do you recall seeing, uh, what, well, do you tell us, what did you see when you first went inside? We first went inside, we walked up to the front door. Did you see any dogs there? Well, after we got to the front door, we saw this dog walk. You saw your this is what I saw. Yes. I saw this dog walking out of the what appeared to be the backyard, and the four of us started backing out of the yard. Why is that? I had no idea what the dog was going to do. <laughs> Did it attack you? No. What color was that dog? It was all black. What did you do at the front door? Well, the dog then laid down. So we went over and knocked on the front door and rang the doorbell. Did you get any answer? No. Great watchdog. Yeah. <laughs> Fierce. Did anybody ring the doorbell? Yes. And did you get an answer to that? No. What happened next? After receiving no answer, then we walked around to the location where the dog was now laying and walked around the dog and into the backyard. Now, were you able to see any lights on in the house before you got inside the property? Yes. Where? The only light that I observed was a light upstairs in the center portion of the residence. That's the only light I observed myself. Were you, I'm sorry? That's the only light I observed myself. And again, before going onto the property, were you able to see any cars in the driveway? I believe I saw one black vehicle in the driveway, yes. Now, after having rung the doorbell and knocked on the door and gotten no answer, what happened next? We, I walked around to the back, to the south side of the residence, I mean, to the north side of the residence, uh, past the dog, and into the backyard to where there was a pool area. And what did you see there? saw the pool, the back of the house, and as I walked closer, we saw some uh, what looked like little cottages or extensions of the house on the south side of the property. Did you have your flashlights with you? We had them originally, but at this time it had gotten light. It was <coughs> what time then? Just shortly before 6. How long after you called the defendant got no answer on his uh, residence phone, did you actually wind up entering the property? I would say five minutes, six, seven minutes, somewhere in that vicinity. Okay. So be roughly about 541, 542? Roughly. Were you able to see the grounds in the backyard when you were walking through it and the pool area? Yes. Did you see anybody injured? No. Were you looking to see that? Yes. What were you looking around for? Why'd you go on the property? We were looking around to find, see if we could. Sustain. Detective, the, the question is just what were you doing? Why were you there, not we? I was looking, we, I had been informed of the possible blood spot on the Bronx. What was he doing here, sir? The question was, why did you go on the property? The response was, you can inform him. Right, which is why I told him to tell us what he did and why he did it, not what we did or why we did it. Do we understand the question? Oh, why don't we st I'll st start what? over, please. <laughs> OK. Ms. Clark. Thank you. you know, may I have a moment, Your Honor? 
So you were on the grounds and you saw the, uh, uh, like a row of guest units? Yes. <clears throat> And where were those guest units in relationship to the main house? They were at the rear of the house, uh, running along the south end of the property, going east away from the main house. 